Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very exciting event, Lawfare's first ever public education course. In this course, we will teach you how to hack. We will show you how to compromise modern computer systems and how to protect yourselves against cyber attacks. In the process, we will also learn a lot about other things such as basic cybersecurity, how the internet works, how encryption works, and why an operating system is like a legal system. Not only will we learn how to hack, we will learn about a lot of other things about the information society in which we live. So uh, strap yourself in, get ready. Let's have fun learning how to hack. My name is Scott Shapiro and I teach at Yale Law School and every class I will be joined by my partner, Sean O'Brien. Please say hi, Sean. Hi, everyone. Uh, together with our friend, Lauren Weisinger, who we will meet in class eight, we designed a course to teach you how to hack. You don't need any background in computers. You don't have to be a techie. All you have to do is know how to use a browser, have access to the internet, and be ready to learn some very cool stuff. I just texted Sean uh, um, last night, uh, uh, kind of reminding him that like six years ago we met in our kitchen, in my kitchen to like write out a syllabus. Like we tried to think, could we teach people who had no background in computers, computer science, coding, uh, who weren't techies, could we teach them enough about hacking so that they would understand what it's all about and what cybersecurity is all about. And uh, it turned out that not only could we teach them enough to understand what hacking is all about, we could actually teach them a lot um, um, for, um, for them to do uh, um, a fair amount of damage. Um, so let me just go through basic aspects of the course. I'll talk about mechanics. I'll talk about the syllabus. So I just want to let me just begin by addressing the first question, which is everyone has, which is they don't believe that they can learn how to hack. And they believe that because, well, it just seems so inaccessible to them. Um, and I just want to say that everyone who takes the class, unless they are very experienced um, uh, in, in technology, and most of the students who take our class um, are not. Uh, they are all very um, uh, apprehensive when they start. Uh, I think they're, they don't believe that they can learn how to do it. And um, I'm here to tell you uh, that uh, you can do it. It's really not hard. You just have to have somebody explain it to you. And as we'll see, there is there, there will be homeworks. You, you will have to work at it a bit um, in order to get, get the material down but um, you are capable of doing it. And I mean, Sean can tell you, we've had some dumb students before. I mean, just, so it's really hard without a laugh track. Um, okay, um, it's really weird. I'm just like. <laughs> so yes, you can do it. Second, second thing. Um, isn't hacking illegal? Yes, hacking in general is illegal when it is done uh, on the open internet, um, uh, when you try to access or you do access in an unauthorized fashion some account. Um, so don't do it. Um, we will show you how to hack legally and safely. I mean safely not only from a legal perspective, but you also don't want to <laughs> ruin your laptop, your desktop computer. Um, and so one of the things that Sean will do is he will take us through the install process, installing VirtualBox, 
which is the virtualization software, and then the to download and then load the image um, of Kali, which will be the operating system that we'll be using uh, for the course. Um, but, but, but seriously, the idea of the course is to teach you about hacking by teaching you how to hack. And because that is what we're doing, we're doing it not so that you go out and victimize other people. It, it would make us very sad if that's what you did. We want you to learn how it is done so that you can protect yourself, but also that you understand how the world in which we live and works. What you will find that by, you know, the seventh, eighth class, I mean, you will understand like basically how the internet works, how operating systems work, um, how networks work. Um, and so I, I, it, in addition to teaching you about hacking and how to hack and how to protect yourself, I just think it, it's a general uh, course for understanding the world around you. And the thing, you know, I, I, I teach at Yale, Sean teaches at Yale, we, we, we're, we teach at a university, our, our goal is not to teach you how to be a script kitty. That is, our goal is not to teach you how to use hacking tools so that you can go out and, um, and, and have some fun. We, we want to teach you the underlying ideas behind it. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it is, after all, a university we teach in, and we want you to come away with a deeper appreciation of how the internet works, how digital communications work, the importance of encryption, and the like. Because this is also lawfare, um, and people might be coming to this because they're interested in regulatory issues, they're interested in policy questions. Um, I think that there is, well, there may be better ways of learning it, but it is incredibly helpful as somebody who um, thought about these policy issues um, in cybersecurity before I learned how to hack and after. Um, uh, when you when you know what's happening, I think you're able to understand what people are talking about, and you know. And when you read the newspaper, I think you'll understand the stories that are coming out. The f the final thing is is uh, people wonder is whether this is, I mean, ethical. Um, it's clearly legal to do to teach people, um, you know, techniques of of. Of, of hacking, that's it, clearly legal. Um, we're not inciting you, we're not encouraging you. In fact, we're trying to do the opposite. We really don't want you to engage in criminal activity. Um, but people have wondered for a very long time um, whether it's ethical to even teach this material. Um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, obviously for lawfare, but also Sean and I, I mean, we care about the ethics of information security. And I'll tell you the basic line that is taken, um, and which, which, which I accept, which is that the bad people, they already know these techniques. Um, they know these techniques either because they um, learned it from other people or they just had access to this very high-tech tool called YouTube. Um, and YouTube, you can learn an enormous amount about hacking from YouTube. <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, I watch hundreds of hours of these, of these videos. Um, uh, so people are able to learn it. We want to teach the people um, who want to protect themselves and want to understand the world around them. Okay, so it, it, the, the ethics are the bad people know about it, the good people don't, and we're here to help you get a better sense of what is going on. Now, our approach, I'm a philosopher, so I, I think theoretically, but the, it's very much part of the idea behind this class is to always um, connect the theoretical abstract stuff that we're doing with practical hands-on activities. Um, that is why we have homework. Um, now, what do I mean by homework? We will post homework on the Lawfare website, Git, um, uh, GitHub repository. Um, 
I don't think the homework, I mean, doesn't take more than a half an hour or a week to do. Um, we do not send it in to us. We, we will, um, we're not going to be marking it. We will post answer sets um, at the end of the week so that you can check yourself. Um, uh, the reason why we have these homework and practical exercises for review is like when you play a musical instrument, you have to learn your scales um, because those are the basic tools that you'll be using to play your instrument. The same thing with the Linux command line. It's really not fun to constantly look up on Google the commands for the things you want to do. It's much more fun if you have it under your belt. Okay, so what we're trying to do is give you some degree of proficiency, some fluency um, in the Linux command line and other um, applications which we'll be introducing later. So what I would hope you do is I would hope that you would do the homework. It's really not burdensome. Um, check yourself um, and I just think it'll make the course much more fun as we go on. So when we teach this course, Sean and I um, have, in addition um, to homework, we also have um, final project that the students have to do for um, their grade. The final project consists of three hacks, videos of three hacks. Now, students are incredibly um, uh, skeptical that they will even be able to produce one hack, let alone three hacks. They will. They always have fun doing it. We're not going to have you do three hacks, but we will have you do one hack do your best one um, and see how um, you'll see how much fun it is. You can send in the videos to us. We will watch them and we will. Oh, excuse me. I said my, my phone's ringing. Hello? Who is this? Hey, this is mom. Oh, mom. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. I'm in the middle of a class. Yeah, okay, just wait about um, 10 more minutes, um, Sean, uh, 10, 15 more minutes, Sean will help us do it, okay? Lo okay, 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 love you, lo love you, Mom, bye. Sorry, sorry, when my mom calls, I have to take it. Um, so, the, you'll send it in, and we'll watch the videos, and um, we will select the, 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 you know, the funnest, most creative hacks, and we will show them the last two classes and we'll talk about them and we'll have fun. I, watching hacks are really, really fun. Um, the ones who will win the competition, you know, some, I mean, somebody may do something really interesting um, uh, technically, but what we really like is when people use um, uh, their creativity, where they use hustle. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in class three, we will be um, doing password cracking. Um, and to engage in password cracking, we'll often do dictionary attacks where, we'll, where the um, cracking application will look to a dictionary of words. Um, you know, lists, they can be thousands, you know, 10,000 words long. The longer they are, generally, the better they are. A student for their one of their final projects assembled a dictionary that was nine million words long. Um, they went on they they, they 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 went on different data breach um, uh, uh, sites. They picked it up from a lot of different areas, and what they did was really super and really interesting. And so, do that. Send it into us, um, and the winner will be um, will be uh, feted and um, get a job at Google zero okay that was those are the mechanics let me just briefly go over the syllabus okay um by the way i always want to say really um uh no joke about the no criming um uh because uh it, it really is true that you will feel like using these tools when you get mad at people do not do it 
I sometimes feel this way. I don't do it. Don't do it. Um, you do not want to. Um, you do not want to get a call from the FBI. Okay. So I am going to uh, uh, share my screen. Let me toggle out of this. Um, okay. So week one. Um, all. Uh, this is not even true. I don't even think we're not even doing half of this stuff. Ignore it. Um, uh, basically, uh, Sean's going to walk us through the install of VirtualBox and Kali um, for my mom. Um, and then he will um, introduce some basic ideas about the file system tree and um, some basic commands uh, on the command line. OK. Um, uh, Okay, week two, get to know your operating system. I know everyone thinks operating systems are really boring. They're not. They're beautiful. Um, and operating systems are like the legal system for your computer. Um, hackers are the outlaws. Uh, there are permission structures. There's a normative structure to, uh, uh, to your account. Um, and we need to learn the, how the permissions are set because these will be exploited and used um, during our hacks, this in the week two, next week can be a bit um, tricky because this is the class where we throw tons of stuff at you. Um, it's not so bad, um, but lots of stuff will be thrown at you. You'll have homework where you go over it, um, and you will get up to speed um, uh, um, in in Linux. Um, okay, uh, week three. Um, week three, identity and access control. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, credentials. We'll be talking about principle of least privilege um, and fun stuff like that. This is the class we'll be doing our first hackery type things. We'll be using an open source um, uh, tool called John the Ripper to crack passwords. This will be our first time uh, doing it. Um, Week four, we'll be talking about the different kinds of operating systems and why hacking is operating system specific. This class tends to be the class that we make up for all the stuff that we said we were going to do in classes one through three and that we didn't do. Okay, and then we, oh, right. One well, other thing that we try to do is we always try to end the class with some hack. So this one will be a person in the middle attack. Um, okay, uh, weeks five through uh, eight, we will have three classes on networks because obviously networks are very important things. We'll be talking about what networks are. We'll be talking about the client server model. And then we will talk about the internet and explain how it is a network of networks. We will have you download Wireshark, which is a free open source tool for packet capturing. Um, really fun. We'll teach you how to snoop on your roommate, um, on your kids, um, uh, good stuff. It's, if it's in your home network, um, um, you know, I shouldn't say it's legal. Um, if you have consent um, from uh, people on your network, um, then you can hack them. But to see the traffic in your network, um, is not even something that you need consent um, to engage in. So we will talk about all these things when we come when we when we come to them. Uh, week six, the second class on network, we'll be diving deeper into how the internet works. We'll be talking about things like ports, sockets, sessions, um, for, uh, VPNs, and the uh, hack we will do is a DDoS. Uh, we will probably try to DDoS um, one of Sean's websites um, in Iceland. Uh, week seven is encryption. Um, this is one of my favorite classes because one of the greatest inventions um, uh, of all time is asymmetric public key encryption. Uh, the internet that we know of would not exist without um, public key encryption. And what, what we will do is we will walk you through how public-private key pairs are generated. Um, we'll explain how it works and then show you how to do it in practice. And then we will show you uh, have some fun with backdoors. Um, 
uh, week eight, more stuff on the Internet and Networks DNS, you know, the thing that maps human readable names like www.google.com to IP addresses, which is the those number dotted number um, uh, addresses that are impossible to remember. We'll talk about firewalls, proxies, reverse proxies, um, and stuff like that. Ch uh, week nine is this is my favorite one. Uh, of all the classes, because this is where everything comes together. By group nine, uh, by week nine, excuse me, um, you will see that everything you have learned in weeks one through eight come together to hack um, a virtual machine that will have you downloaded. Uh, uh, that will have you download called Metasploitable. It's an intentionally vulnerable operating system, um, and then we will have you download Metasploit, which is the largest open source exploit framework in the world. It has, you know, the crown jewels of the NSA when they were leaked, they got put into Metasploit. Metasploit is an enormous, amazingly powerful device used by pen testers, penetration testers to test the, um, the soundness and security of their clients who give them uh, consent to hack them to see what the vulnerabilities are. And I, we will show you how to do them. Most people use Metasploit um, to do their hacks for their final project. Um, so um, it's really exciting and fun. And you'll see like why people get really into this. Um, okay, week 10, we'll be learning all about the dark web and anonymity. Um, uh, one of the things we do in week nine is we exfiltrate data. And in week 10, um, we'll, we'll show you this really cool way of using uh, onion routing to share files anonymously. It's really, really cool. Um, and so that's week 10. Week 11, we'll be doing chains of trust. How do you know that the software that you're downloading is the software that you think you're downloading? Um, and this is extraordinarily important um, in this new world of supply chain attacks. You will understand by week 11 all the stuff that goes into this digital signatures, certificates, all the stuff you'll learn on week, uh, week 11, week 12. We'll be talking about cybercrime, crime as a service, crypto, all this stuff couldn't be more fun. Uh, week 13 and 14, we will review the hacks, um, and, um, and that's that. So I'm going to stop sharing. I am going to um, turn this over to Sean. So this is the Git repository. Um, this is the place where we'll be updating materials. As you can see, I just updated it less than an hour ago. Um, this is going to be your one-stop shop for the materials in the class. After class, I'll make sure I update this with whatever exercises we did do. Um, you know, when we remix the syllabus, so to speak, um, week by week, which we will definitely do, um, I'll make sure that all that is updated in here. Um, but I just want to point your attention to something which will definitely be very helpful, especially early on um, in this too long didn't read section in the README. Um, you can open a command line interface in your browser. If you click that link, um, you'll get this nice little JavaScript-based terminal emulator, okay? Now, this is a command line interface. Most of what we'll be doing, almost all of it, um, is going to be in the command line. Um, and some of you may remember this kind of environment from, you know, let's say using MS-DOS back in the 80s and early 90s or maybe you've used it even on your Mac to do specific things, or maybe you have a more technical background and you're more comfortable with it. Um, this browser-based environment is really nice because it sort of gives you a sandbox you can play in, and you can do all the basic commands we're going to do, the few we're gonna do today, and then also uh, next week, and maybe even the following week. However, um, you will not be able to do the hacks, the DDoSing, the Metasploit, all that cool, you know, hackery stuff in this environment. So you do need to make sure you get a virtualization environment with Kali Linux running. Um, and that's why we're helping you to do that. Um, 
as far as you know, questions about system requirements for doing that. Um, you're going to be running a virtual machine, which is an operating system inside of an operating system. Very, very cool stuff. Awesome technology, but it does take a little bit of hardware churn. You know, it takes some specs. Um, so these are the ones we're recommending. 4 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of disk space, which is not a lot these days, but, you know, if you download a lot or whatever, you need to make sure you don't fill up your, your hard drives or you could be in trouble. Um, 64 bit CPU, multiple core, generally speaking, that's what everybody's running. Um, just a decent graphics card, doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to be, you know, cryptocurrency mining on your graphics card. <laughs> so <laughs> we're not going to be doing anything nuts in that direction. And a good solid broadband internet connection, um, especially in these early weeks when we're downloading things like virtual machines and so on. Um, even on my connection, which is really solid here and the Yale connection that Scott has as well right now. Um, it can take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to download Cali, for example. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something you want to make sure you, you do. Um, don't use a computer older than the start of COVID. That's the rule of thumb we're going with. Um, if you have to, and we understand, like, not everybody can just run out and buy a computer, borrow a computer, we will try to help you triage and get through that. 32-bit machines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll do our best. But um, in many cases, if you end up with like weird, you know, messages saying things like kernel panic and so on and so forth, if you have a friend's computer, a family member's computer, some computer you can borrow specifically for this course, um, that would be really helpful. Um, and sometimes it's better off not trying to fight software and just finding a, a different hardware setup um, with different software and, and just trying it. Um, okay. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, download and install VirtualBox, and I realize some of you may have done this already, um, but still we're going to walk through it. Um, and we, you know, are providing screenshots here in the uh, repo. Um, I'll also be providing after class um, a screen share of me going through this process, um, and we'll have as much documentation as we possibly can on this. But also I link to videos that are already pre-existing out there on the internet. Um, four different operating systems, installation tutorials, some others have done that are recent showing this process. Okay, so if you click the, you know, uh, click here down to download the VirtualBox installer, it'll bring you out to the VirtualBox download page. Um, and you're going to download these binaries, right? Binaries are programs, they're pre-compiled executables in this case um, that will run to, you know, load the virtual environment. Um, if you're a Windows user, you're going to have an exe. Um, you can probably see it in the little toolbar at the bottom of the Firefox browser here. It's very small, but it'll be a .exe file. I mean, you're probably familiar in Windows on how that works. You download the thing, you double click on it, you click next a few times, you may or may not read the terms of service, probably not, um, and then you install. All the software we're um, going to be recommending in this course is um, safe. Um, we've edited it ourselves, we've used it in classes before. It's also free and open source software, um, so it's well audited. Um, it's very solid from a security perspective. It's very solid from a privacy perspective. Um, as I said, you know, I run something called Privacy Lab at Yale. I would never recommend something that has advertisements or, you know, some sort of inherent spying or anything like that. Um, so we want to make sure that you're very comfortable with what we're recommending. Um, on this um, Mac that I'm on right now, I'm going to click OSX Hosts here. Um, and you'll see, I, I did this a little bit earlier today, so you'll see I did it before. But there's a DMG file that is uh, downloading right now. Now, DMG file is sort of like a disk image. It's like an installer, similar-ish to a uh, what you would have on Windows, right? Um, and you'll see it here in my downloads, in my finder. Here's my DMG. Um, so I open that. And OK, it is open. Cool. Um, on a Mac. The way that you install is by dragging into the applications folder, okay? Um, you could just try to open that and it might do the same thing. But what that does is it copies this .package installer to the applications and then installs VirtualBox. Again, just for time, we're not going to sit through all that. I've already done it, um, so I'm just going to launch VirtualBox. Um, but your mileage may vary. It might take you a little longer um, to get it going. Okay, so I'm going to watch it, make sure that it opens. You'll see the penguin here with the toolbox. Um, if you get to this point, great. You're all set. It's, you know, you have VirtualBox running. So that first part is done, okay? Now, on some systems, 
um, you know, as we go along, if you notice weird things with the mouse or some issues um, using Kali and so on, you may also need this thing called the VirtualBox extension pack. Um, so you may have to install that as well. I'm not going to go through that right now, but if you do need that, um, you know, we'll try to help with it. Um, hypothetically, you shouldn't. Um, the installer here should have everything you need. Um, and for those uh, Linux users, you know, welcome. I'm, I'm glad we have some technical folks as well. Um, VirtualBox is usually provided um, in Linux distributions through um, software repositories. We're going to talk about all that, like software supply chain. That's one of the classes, I think it's class eight or nine. Um, it's one of my favorite subjects, as Scott said, um, so we will get into it. But if you're a Linux user, I'm not saying, hey, we won't walk you through it, but you're probably best to grab whatever your operating system ships already. So if you use Ubuntu, you know, the Ubuntu store, um, if you use Debian, Linux Mint, that kind of thing, look up VirtualBox, see if you can get it directly from your OS, and then you don't have to download this stuff manually. Okay, very, very cool. So I've got VirtualBox going now, and I need to grab my operating system that I'm going to run in VirtualBox. And again, you know, we have links out to that, Kali Linux. Um, Kali Linux is a pen testing hacking operating system. As Scott said, um, we're going to be grabbing the pre-built virtual machine, um, and in this case, the 64-bit virtual machine for that. Um, so you can click the link in the uh, GitHub repository, or you can just go out to the Kali.org site. Um, make sure you go out to pre-built VMs here, and that'll bring you down to the um, area with the virtual machine. Um, now, as I mentioned in the Git repository, and I saw somebody in chat mentioned VMware, um, VMware is the most well-known enterprise virtualization software. Um, we're using VirtualBox for a number of reasons, but mostly because it's free of cost um, for everyone. Um, but if you can use VMware and you want to use it, you totally can. Um, again, I have to keep saying your mileage may vary. Um, we're not going to be able to support VMware users as well, um, but maybe you have a system administrator at your school or wherever you're at um, who can help you uh, with that, or maybe you can do it yourself, um, which would be very cool. Okay, so to download Kali, you're going to click the little download arrow here. Um, you could, of course, use BitTorrent if you know how to use BitTorrent. Um, it will be a little faster, generally speaking, and a little less um, uh, uh, grueling on your uh, local network probably. Um, but if not, just download the uh, little download icon here. I'm not going to do that. I already downloaded it before. It would take way too much time to do in class right now, um, 10, 15 minutes-ish um, on a good connection. But you're going to get this 7-zip file, this .7z. Now, that's um, like a .zip, which you may be familiar with, but it's a slightly different format. On the Mac here, you can open that um, without any issues on the latest versions of Mac OS. Um, on Windows, you may need to download a 7-zip um, extractor or a program like pzip, P-E-A, like the vegetable zip, um, or isarc, I-Z-A-R-C. Um, those programs, you may need to, to open this. Uh, if you do, that's, that's how you do it. You can also just use a search engine and say, hey, how do I extract a 7-zip file and, and um, try to get a, a program that will do it for you. Um, okay, so... You double click on this, it extracts. Again, that takes a few minutes. You end up with a folder like this, um, and you go into that folder. Now you have two files here. The first one is this orange cube. That's the virtual disk image, the .vdi file. Um, that's kind of like the hard drive for the virtual machine. And then the other file, this blue cube, is the vbox file, and that's the virtual box settings. Um, so what's very cool is they bundled it with pre, you know, default settings, so we don't have to walk everybody through every option. That simplifies things somewhat. Um, previously in classes at Yale, we've had to like go through every single setting, but thankfully they're bundling things this way now, so it's a little easier. So I double click on that, um, you know, open that, and uh, it just loads in VirtualBox. Um, if you get to this step, you're almost there. So we're getting very close, um, and this is very exciting. Um, you'll see it says Kali Linux uh, 2022, whatever, that's the build. Um, version of when it came out. Um, you're going to click settings here, this gear, and then you're going to see a bunch of defaults in here. Don't touch this stuff, generally speaking. We may touch some of it down the line, and depending on the hacks you do, you may play with certain things. So, like, if you're going to do microphone hacks, you might play with the audio tab here, right? But generally speaking, we're not going to do that at this point. 
Um, what we do need to look at is this network. So this icon with the two little computer monitors, it sort of looks like the network icon you may be used to. Um, we need to make sure your network adapter is enabled, right? So this virtual machine needs to use the network card, the Wi-Fi card, the Ethernet card potentially um, of the machine that you're on. It needs to basically, you know, act as if it's your host operating system, even though it's a guest operating system inside your OS. And for that reason, you need to make sure it says attached to bridged adapter. Um, in many cases, this will be NAT, network address translation. When we get to networking, we'll talk about the differences between these things. Um, NAT will probably work for you. And if bridged adapter gives you some errors, you know, you can kind of fall back to NAT. But from a security standpoint, it's not very good for your Kali install. <laughs> okay. And um, we'll get into that. But um, for right now, you know, try to do bridged adapter, um, see if that'll work. And you'll see in my case, it opens up the Wi Fi card um, that the Mac has. Okay. So that one setting we change attached to bridged adapter, we click OK. And then we click the green arrow that says Start. Now, while this is loading, um, it's worth saying you're going to get a bunch of dialogues popping up at you. You might get like security preference dialogues on both Windows and a Mac saying, hey, allow virtual box access, the microphone, the speaker, you know, to do X, Y, Z. Again, we vetted all this stuff. Um, make sure you put in your administrative password and give your operating system the um, permissions it's going to need. Permissions is another thing we'll go into. Um, and that's uh, something Scott definitely loves uh, talking about. Um, but on your host uh, operating system, you've got to make sure that VirtualBox can do what it needs to do to run Kali, which may also be a good reason to use a separate machine in some cases, right? If you're using a work machine that's really locked down, um, that you know doesn't allow you to do very much, like install your own programs, you're probably going to have some issues um, with that. Um, on my machine, you're not seeing those dialogues, A, because I've run through this before, and B, because it's a personal machine that I've already given quite a bit of permission to the user. Um, on it, but you know, you might have a sysadmin who doesn't like people doing stuff and really, really locks down machines. And that's uh, that's a topic we'll definitely talk about too conceptually. Like, you know, how much locking down is too much? It's a it's a tough one. It depends on the environment. Um, another thing you may notice is it may prompt you to restart. Um, so you may have to in between these steps when you go to start, it'll get an error or something, and your OS may say, "Hey, you got to restart." Um, if that happens. Um, you know, don't panic, you know, restart your machine. Please don't do that now. Stay in the stream. You can do it later. Um, but, uh, you know, you may have to do that. And the reason that may have to happen is because your kernel, which is the piece of software that talks to the hardware on your um, device, um, may need to run a specific virtualization driver um, to get this whole thing to work. And that's basically just making sure that, like, the virtual environment has access to the things that it needs, the keyboard, the mouse, you know, the graphics card, um, so that it can act like a computer with a, in a computer, which is really what it is. Um, also, you'll see these little dialogues which come up, um, which may just seem like visual cruft, but you should probably read through them the first time. Um, as you see, when my mouse pointer goes in and out here, it's just normal in and out without any issues, right? Um, but you may find that on your system, VirtualBox captures the mouse and then when you go to the edge of the window it just won't leave right um that means that you'll have to hit a, a specific key and VirtualBox will tell you what key um it's usually left command on a, a mac and i believe it's right control on a windows machine um so like i might have to like hit left command if i can't get out um you can always of course close VirtualBox if you kind of panic and can't figure it out um and yeah it's very useful to like hit escape you know use the menu up here to, to shut down Okay, I'm in, beautiful login screen, very cool hackery environment with a dragon for those House of the Dragon fans out there. Um, the default password is not very secure. Um, it's Kali and then Kali. Um, so username Kali, password Kali, hit login. And we're getting there. Wonderful. So fun to do demos live for, you know, triple digit uh, fans and not have issues. <laughs> um, hopefully we can keep that uh, streak going, which is now just a one class streak, of course. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. All right. Um, now I want to try to zoom in. That's what I'm trying to do here. Let's see. Yeah, I can. Totally.
hopefully zoom in um, so that you can see what I just opened. Um, up here, there's the little black box that looks a lot like that JS Linux environment, right? This environment, um, but it's inside of Kali. It's the terminal inside of this operating system. Um, this command line interface now will run commands inside of Kali. Um, so we're going to walk through a few of those. Um, we've got, you know, approximately 15 minutes, um, get a little comfortable with the environment. Um, and I will have to be a little fast. So if you don't catch all of it, that's totally cool. We'll make sure that the commands are in a list, you know, in a file in the Git repo. You can try it at your own pace. We also like, you know, kind of the basic get comfortable commands that if you find a tutorial on Linux or this thing called Unix that it's kind of based on, um, you will also um, find them online pretty easily. Okay, first thing, what is this? Where am I? Well, I'm user Kali on machine Kali. Okay, and in other terminals, you won't have this fancy K icon. It would probably be an app. Okay, um, let's figure out where I am. I'm going to type PWD, which stands for Print Working Directory. I'm going to hit Enter. I'm in slash home slash Kali. That is my home folder. Generally speaking, um, when you log into a properly configured machine, um, the user is going to be dropped into a home folder specifically for them. That's so you can have multiple users on the system and they can have their own little sandbox, kind of like the concept of like a My Documents folder, you know, desktop, whatever, um, on your machine. Um, so I'm in slash home slash Kali. This is the place where the Kali user can do what they need to. And the permissions for this directory are designed to allow Kali to do that. In other parts of the operating system, you have to have privilege escalation. You have to get privileges, let's say, as the root user, which we will definitely talk about. Um, and uh, that's may mean that like some things don't work. And one of the reasons we go through permissions, one of the reasons we go through, you know, the um, directory structure and so on, is to make sure that you feel comfortable in this environment. A lot of the hacking that you're going to do is going to have to do with things like privilege escalation, like navigating other systems that you sort of like break into and so on. Um, and to do that, you need to be comfortable moving around your own system first, right? Okay. Print working directory tells you where you are. Um, now I'm going to type ls, which stands for list. Um, and you'll see I've got a bunch of uh, directories in here, um, including a directory cats, which I made the other day. Um, but on your system, you're just going to have desktop documents, music, downloads, pictures, etc. cetera. Okay? Um, this is a basic view. It's when you have a lot of folders and files, it can get kind of cluttered, um, which is why you should probably do something, which, believe it or not, this terminal recommends to you. Um, ls space minus l. That minus l, you'll see it's colored differently in this terminal, which is very helpful. Um, it's something called a switch. It's a way to complement or send, you know, options to the uh, command ls in this case um, to augment it, to make it do something slightly different. So I do ls space minus l, I hit enter, and I get a list view. Um, this now shows a bunch of stuff about permissions, which we'll get into. It shows who the owner and the group, another concept we'll get into, um, of these folders is. It shows how many um, uh, bytes these files are, and it shows when those files were created, which was just yesterday. Um, so very, very cool stuff gives you a view which may be a little confusing, but you'll get used to it. And in fact, you'll be a wizard at it by the time we're done. Now, my terminal is filling up. This gets a little rough. You don't want to have a terminal that's really cluttered. If this starts happening to you, um, one thing you can do is you can type clear. Okay, and these commands should all work inside of that JS Linux browser command line too. Like you should be able to clear it and so on. So don't feel like if you get to the bottom of it, you're going to be lost or something. It's good command to know. Okay, cool. So now I've seen folders, uh, you know, inside of my home folder. Uh, I've seen these directories. Um, how do I navigate? in and out of these things, right? Um, well, I use a command called cd. That's for change directory. And let's say in this case, I want to go into the directory called cats, OK? So now I'm in my home folder slash cats. I'm going to type pwd to make sure. Slash home slash cali slash cat. That's where I'm at. And you'll see there's a shortcut for my home directory here. It's a tilde, the little squiggly line, um, and a forward slash. Uh, that's really useful because it's a shortcut for whatever the user's home directory is. 
if you write a generic piece of software, you're not going to know that it's Callie or Scott or Sean or whatever nicknames we may have, you know, on our system. You're not going to know all that stuff. Um, but you want to make sure you can, you know, run scripts, run software, you know, do things uh, that target a user's home directory. So that shortcut is really invaluable in that case. If I were to CD, for example, back to just tilde, and then I did a PWD, you'd see it slash home slash Cali. And if I CD slash home slash Cali, I do, do PWD, same thing, right? Uh, let's clear that again. Very basic stuff. Okay, we're going to go into cats again, CD cats. Um, and something that's very useful for you to know, like if you hit CD space, and you start typing the letter C in this case, maybe it's capital D, E for desktop in your case or some other um, folder name. And you hit the tab on your keyboard. Uh, most terminal environments, most command line environments will um, auto fill in the name for you. And that's such a big deal when you've got a four letter directory, right? But when you have, um, you know, these long file names, which can be generated especially for things like logs and so on, um, you're going to want to be able to use that. And it will try to autofill as far as it can. Um, so um, let's do another trick first. I'll show you that. CD space dot dot will bring me up one level. And again, the DOS users, I think, are pretty familiar with this. The syntax is very similar, but just a little different. Um, I always say DOS and Microsoft slowly reinvented Unix, but that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I went up one level um, doing CD space dot dot. And I do an LS, I'm back in the home directory. Let's say I wanted to CD into desktop, right? I type the letter, capital letter D and I hit tab. Now it'll actually say, okay, there's three directories here um, that start with that. And if it were a file name I was working on or something, same thing. So now I've got to do DE. And now when I hit tab, I get desktop. Very cool. Huh? I do an LS, oh, I've got nothing in my desktop, um, but we can change that in a few moments. Before we do, I wanted, again, make sure we talk about some of the stuff that we promised you we would in the file system. Um, I'm going to bring you all the way up to the top level. So CD space forward slash. That's the top, tippy top level of your operating system. Okay, and that's going to be true across the board, whatever OS you're on, um, whatever machines you dial into um, that use this Unix uh, command line environment. Um, I do LS here. And you'll see a bunch of folders, um, which with much less friendly names, generally speaking. You'll see the home directory here, right? Um, you'll see bin, which is where binaries, you know, basic programs are. Um, you'll see et cetera, which is actually, even though it has a name that means like other stuff, <laughs> it's actually extremely important. It's got a bunch of configuration files, which we will definitely be editing as we do our hacks. Um, and you'll see here, I want to point you to the root directory that's for the root user. Again, the concept we'll get into, but that's where the, the home for the root user is. That's their little sort of private home directory. All right. One more thing before the top of the hour here. We're going to go back into our home directory. If we try to do stuff at this top level, we don't have permission right now. We're just a lowly Kali user, just the normal user, not the super user or the root user. So we can't really do stuff at this level of the operating system besides C, right? So we need to go back into our home. So we're going to CD and we're going to do just tilde. And now we're going to do LS. We know where we are. Clear again to make sure that things look nice. And I already have a directory called cat, so why don't I create a directory called dogs? Um, so I'm going to do mkdir, which is make dir, create a directory. And I'm going to call, call it dogs. And call it whatever you want on your end. If you have birds, that's great. I have chickens and quail, so you know maybe next time. Um, okay, directory called dogs. I go into dogs, cd space dogs. Do my ls again. Nothing there, right? We're just going to create an empty file. Um, we're not really going to do anything with it today, um, but I want you to know that you can do this. Um, so we're going to use a command called touch. Um, now, I previously made a file called awesome cats. So you'll see my terminal recommending that to me. As you have a terminal history, you'll see your terminal also does shortcuts like that, which is very cool and very fun for hackers because it makes this very quick and efficient sort of natural language um, environment for folks. Um, and in many cases, you'll find, um, you know, as we progress, 
there's a lot, lot of things you can do on your file system in the command line environment um, that if you have literacy of this environment and you have literacy of the graphical environment, which most of us do, um, then you can be very powerful on your system. Like you can rename a thousand files where you would have to like right click and do that or download a specific program. You can do that in the terminal in this command line environment if you get good. Okay, cool. So um, touch space awesome dash dogs dot text. I'm just gonna make a very basic text file. I'm gonna hit enter. You don't have to put in that extension part, that dot text. We'll get into that later too. But in my case, I did. And um, we basically now, if we do ls, we have a file. If we do ls minus l, we have a file with these specific permissions, um, zero bytes, because it's got nothing in it. Um, and it's owned by Kali, the user, and Kali, the group, and we just created it. Um, so you should see something similar in your environment. Um, one last piece which I want to do, which we're not going to go crazy about, but I just want you to know that like um, the terminal is a interactive environment where you can get useful information. Um, we'll edit these files. We'll do all that fun stuff later. Um, but for right now, I want you to know where you can get help in the terminal, in the command line, without necessarily having to just go to the search engine all the time looking up stuff. Um, that said, you know, um, Wikipedia is a great resource. I want to make sure I point you to that. Um, hackers and computer people have done a really good job of documenting these commands there. Um, search engines, generally speaking, will have good shortcuts for you. But just be careful copy and pasting stuff into your terminal and running it. You know, sometimes people play jokes on purpose, telling you to, like, delete your entire system with a command. So you just got to be careful pasting stuff in. Um, but let's say I wanted to know, you know, LS, I want to know more about it. Um, I want to know what I can do with it besides just the basic list view. Well, I can do LS space dash dash help. And generally speaking, um, you'll be able to do dash dash help, or with some commands, it'll be dash H for help. Um, and you'll get uh, a little mini sort of instruction manual. Um, and this is why the graphical environment helps. You either hit page up on your keyboard if you have it, or shift page up, or as I'm doing, use your mouse. Um, so it's nice to have both options. Uh, this manual tells you, hey, here's the usage. Here's LS. You put in these options, these switches after it, and then you operate it on a file or a directory, right? So if I want to get a list view of the directory slash bin, which we talked about with those like binary files, I can do ls, the command, then the option, and then the thing I'm operating on, which in this case is the folder slash bin. And I get a list of what slash bin does. In this case, it just goes to user slash bin. Um, okay, cool. Um, you can also do ls minus l slash etc, see what's in etc, which again, expected to be a little more interesting. Tons of files in here, right? Um, and now you start seeing the nitty gritty of your file system and, and why we're walking you through all this. Um, we don't want you to be inundated. We want you to explore. We want you to be able to use these commands. And um, by the end of this course, and really by mid this course, you definitely will be able to do it. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, there's some other stuff I can show you. There's a command called man for manual, where I can do man ls, and it will give me like a little more I want to call it graphical, but a little nicer, I guess, view. I have the down arrow here, and then it says press H for help or Q to quit. So if you think you're stuck in this view, you hit Q. For more complex commands, like some of the networking stuff and so on, you might want to read the full manual. If you've heard hackers say RTFN, read the effing manual. Um, that's what they mean, read the manual. Um, okay, cool. And I guess that's pretty much it. I'll check the chat now and um, stop sharing. And uh, back to you, Scott. Sean, that was really super helpful. I, I, I want to, um, like, Sean just showed you, like, some very basic stuff. But, you know, if you think about, you know, he broke into somebody's account, could be he CD'd went CD into that person's account. You know, I mean, there's a way in which, like, what you saw Sean do and what you will be doing for um, very basic homework, either in the browser bar uh, or in the um, in Cali, um, will be the basic things that get used 
in hacking, as as Sean said, um, you know, so much of it is learning how to navigate your file system um, so that you can navigate somebody else's file system. Speaking of that, I a couple of years ago, I I made three videos. Um, three, not two. Uh, I said on those little videos um, for each class that there were two videos, each were three minutes apiece. I don't know why I thought that, because actually there are three videos, each 15 minutes apiece. Um, so um, um, what I would like you to do is watch those videos for homework. And so that's about 40 minutes, um, but it goes through a lot of the stuff that Sean went through gives a kind of um, deeper understanding of what the file system is, how it works, how to navigate it. Um, and so please watch that those, those three videos, which we'll put up in the repo, and also um, a couple of homework exercises. Um, and then we'll be ready for our next class.